Well, our next guest, Hanan Ashrawi, was a close confidant of the late Palestinian negotiator, working very closely with Saab Erekat on a number of Palestinian causes over the years. You can see them here together in Washington, next to Madeleine Albright, more than 20 years ago. Hanan is a member of the PLO's executive committee. She was at the funeral just earlier, paying her respects, and I'm delighted to say that she's made time to join us today um, from... Ramallah and Hanan, thank you. Um, a, a very sad thank you. time. Mm -hmm. Your memories of yeah. Saib, if you will. Well, it's been a very long relationship. It started more than 40 years ago, almost in the 1980s, mm. uh, when we were both academics. But I was also a very uh, strong activist, and we were working in, in terms of uh, uh, resistance and intifada and so on. So in, in many ways, it's a multifaceted relationship that was made up of mm. activism, mm. academic work, as well as political work, as well as negotiations. Uh, and somehow it maintained a momentum. Uh, Saab was a man with total dedication, with total immersion in, in national causes. Uh, it's not just his negotiations. People think of him as a negotiator. But in, in a variety of ways, to him, Palestine was a way of life. It was an obsession. It was a dedication. He was a passionate uh, um, a patriot. And, and therefore, every aspect of his life had to do with Palestine had to do with ending this conflict. And he kept repeating the one line that got him friends and enemies at the same time, which is the two-state solution, 67 boundaries, Jerusalem as capital, and, and that's it. So uh, he was unwavering, mm -hmm. dedicated, almost obsessive, and at the same time inclusive. He was a man of the people, and he knew that uh, mm -hmm. he was held accountable by the people, and he knew he had to explain uh, to people, his positions. And at the same time, he knew that he had to reach out to the rest of the world and present a Palestinian narrative and a Palestinian argument that wasn't always very easy to present, given all the odds against us. Sure, Hanan, and, and you know, there will be those who say he was controversial, not least within his his own people. Um, but you make some you make some very good points uh, about his immersion in the Palestinian cause. I do, though, want to talk to you about his negotiating skills because, of course, you know, they were uh, preeminent and, and so many people around the world will remember Saeb for those. In the wake of his death, you tweeted that his passing is a, quote, significant transition in Palestinian history and reality. And Eric had himself once famously said, who will be the Palestinian in the next 1,000 years, looking at my experience and what we've done and who will be willing to sit with the Israelis at the table. Hanan, will there be another Palestinian willing to do that now that Saeb Arakat is gone? Yeah, it's not a matter of personal choice. It's not a matter of individuals mm. who will be willing to sit. It's a question of conditions for negotiations. After all, negotiations are a means and not an end. And if you want to achieve a negotiated settlement to which Saeb was totally committed, then you have to have the proper conditions, the terms of reference, the clear objectives, uh, not just a peace process, but an incremental process that would lead to the end to the occupation and so on. It's unfortunate, but many people sort of associate Saeb with, with the failures or successes, but mainly failures of negotiations. They fail to see that it was Israeli intransigence and occupation. It was American bias and total support of Israeli criminality that destroyed the chances of peace. And with the last four years of the Trump administration, it was an unmitigated disaster. There was no way in which you could achieve any kind of peace, given the, the criminality of Israel and given collusion by the U.S. and given unilateral illegal steps by the Trump administration that destroyed the very foundations of it. So blaming Saeb or And, and Saeb Arakat himself described the Trump administration's policies as, quote, setting Palestinians and Israelis back some 50 years. I spoke to him earlier this year, Hanan, after the so-called deal of the century was announced at the White House. Um, and I asked him what he thought would happen next. This was back in January. Have a listen. What will happen next, Becky, 
is that there will be a unanimous Arab decision to reject this fraud and this so-called deal mm. and to reiterate our position as Arabs, Arab countries, in unanimity of the two-state solution on the 1967 line. Well, of course, what actually happened was three Arab states normalized relations with Israel. More may follow, not least the Saudis. As I say, he described this administration's policies as setting the Israelis and the Palestinians back by 50 years. And, but the, I think it would be fair to say, although I know you're going to argue with me on this, that the Palestinian leadership has been at a loss as to how to respond to this sort of wave of normalization. No, actually, we did talk about this, you and I, Becky, earlier. The, uh, mm. You're normalizing the abnormal, you're no normalizing the occupation, you're normalizing impunity, you're normalizing land theft, you're normalizing uh, uh, expansionism, and, and, of course, defying and, and violating international law. This is not what is needed, because by normalizing, some Arab countries, under coercion, by the way, and the U.S. used tremendous threats and blackmail, and you were to, to really put pressure on countries that were in need of the U.S., and so it used that to deliver, not just trying to deliver Palestine to Israel, mm -hmm. but trying to deliver the Arab world and the region to Israel and to reposition mm -hmm. Israel as a major force in the region. The American administration, Trump in particular, seemed to be working for Netanyahu and for the most extreme right-wing government in Israel and was putting pressure. Look, American officials were scurrying mm -hmm. all over the region trying to uh, deliver sure. uh, uh, gains to Israel before elections. They didn't succeed, of course, let, let but me, still. Let, let, me, yeah. let, let me do... Let, let's just... Let's look forward here. Um, because there is yes, a new yes. leadership in the United States, whether or not Donald Trump want, you know, wants to concede at this point or not. There will be a new administration um, on January the 20th, uh, 20th, a leadership that you said would not be a saviour for the Palestinians. Yeah. I wonder why, why, you, why you believe that. And, and it has to be said, you know, there will be even Palestinians watching this who say, you know, is it going to take another generation of leadership before mm -hmm. we get a win out of this? Look, Becky, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the, the damage that has been done by the Trump administration is, administration is extremely serious and has been extremely corrosive. Right now, the mere fact of ending the Trump era is extremely significant. Palestinians, uh, ordinary people down the street are just delighted they don't have to deal with Trump anymore or the Trump plan or Trump populism and racism and xenophobia, Islamophobia and so and anti-Semitism and uh, misogyny. These are things that, are, that just go against the grain and uh, against human decency. So now people are delighted that this is over. That's one. But you cannot talk about going back to the status quo ante. If the Democrats think that they can repeat the mistakes of the past and they can do the mainstream business as usual with all the refrains of let's deliver to Israel what Israel needs in order to persuade Israel to negotiate or let's support Israel and there's no daylight between us and Israel and so on, they will fail again. If they start picking up all the same old faces and tired people who were responsible for failure, they will fail again. They have to understand there's a new vision, a new language. Palestine is part of the conversation. Palestine is part of the human rights, rule of law, multilateralism uh, right. conversation. We are part of this new emerging global reality that says you cannot live on injustice and impunity and treat people with differences right. and with discrimination. Right. So that's, that has to be Hello. new. And, yeah. I, I, yeah, I understand. And, 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 and apologies, because I'm, I'm going to have to take a break, but it's been superb having you on. Thank you so much. And I know it's not an easy day for you.